Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Profit Minds podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch, creator of the Profit Minds Growth System, a unique blend of profit growth, productivity acceleration, and building robust business process for scale. In every episode, I interview entrepreneurs and small business owners from around the world with a unique story to tell. You can find the show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Steve. It's a joy to be on your podcast. It's so great to have you here. So tell me uh, a little bit about your history so people understand. You and I have known each other for many years. Um, but but what is it that you do and, and, and how did you get there? Well, what I do now is I'm a presentation skills trainer, which includes training people how to be speakers, but also helps you present yourself within an organization. Fundamentally, I work with high level women in tech and law who have a seat at the table, finally, and still aren't being listened to. <clears throat> the most, the main thing that clients come to me with is they're frustrated. They're, they say, I have all this st stuff to offer and people aren't listening. So what I do is help them raise their visibility and increase their value or, or actually make the, the value that they know they have visible to their organization. And then they can then they can get the the funding they need or the salary they need and the allies they want. And most especially, they can get the recognition that they deserve. Yeah. And, and, and so why are you so passionate about this? Why is it that that this matters to you? Well, I made my made my way up through the the business world as an entrepreneur as an international opera director and that was a very male dominated business in the days that i was mostly doing it it's finally having more women at last but as an opera director and especially as someone who who does good solid work i wouldn't do do shocking things for the sake of the shock value, which unfortunately is what gets you press. Uh, I worked my way up from driving the truck and sweeping the stage. That really was my first job to directing at the Metropolitan Opera and internationally to then running my own opera company, international company in the Austrian Alps. And from there, I started leveraging that, that knowledge to help business professionals. And I started noticing that the people who came to me mostly were women. It was the women who were showing up at my doorstep um, because they weren't being listened to. We all know stories of women being talked over in meetings or making suggestions and nobody pays attention. And then five minutes later, a man makes, uh, makes the same suggestion and everybody says, wow, how, how amazing, wonderful. That's one of the more common uh, examples. There's lots and lots more. Uh, having been a woman, fighting her way up and having scars from the glass ceiling myself, I decided that was where I really wanted to focus. Um, also because I got, you know, I got to running an opera company in Austria. I got to directing Luciano Pavarotti and Placido Domingo around the world by making all the mistakes. So mm. As with uh, many trainers and coaches, I'm trying to help people not make the same mistakes that I did. Yeah, Steve, so, I don't know if you've ever you you probably never make any of these, of these mistakes. Oh but, goodness, uh, no, I never make. No, of course, no, no. everybody. I you know that that's that's one of the things that that you learn as an entrepreneur, right? Is is that you know every mistake is a learning opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, nobody ever does it perfectly. 
Right. Right. So, so, so what was your experience with the glass ceiling? You talked about the glass. Well, I knew as a stage director, I was the person that said to the, to the singers, um, you go here, you go there. And depending on who they are, they would do it or they wouldn't. Um, Luciano Pavarotti went wherever he wanted. So I would say, say, so Luciano, in Italian, of course, I would say, you know, so tell me where you're going to be so I can make sure that you're, they're out of your way. But, um, he was his own category. <laughs> you know, he he did what he wanted and he got away with it because he was Luciano Pavarotti. Um, most people weren't like that. I knew I wanted to run an opera company. And in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s, I was applying for jobs as an artistic director, general director. There would be four to six openings a year. And I was consistently on the short list. I was often flown in for the interview. And then over and over, I saw the job go to a man, sometimes a man who wasn't as qualified as I was, but who you know, people thought that he would be cool because he was European or something. Uh, what I discovered was that, uh, so then ultimately, um, no one would give me an opera company to run, so I made one. And through that, learned that actually I needed to do something else. After 30 years, I was beginning to get burned out with by the music. And it became too much work. And I realized if I don't stop now, I will lose the ability to be moved by the music. And by then I was already training speakers. So I moved to speakers. I let opera go. I loved it. 30 wonderful years, but I was done. And what I've discovered with the glass ceiling process, which I didn't understand at the time, but I understand now that what I'm teaching is teaching women how to present themselves as valuable. What I discovered was that being recognized by your peers is not good enough. You actually have to market yourself to the people who do the hiring, which is now what how I help women in business, in organizations. They have to pay attention to who's hiring. If you're an entrepreneur, you have to market yourself to what the client really wants, as opposed to being the best kept secret in the business. That was me. I was a best kept secret. What I realized was that when I, when people are looking for money for, for opera, let me start that one over. What I realized was that for opera companies to run an opera company, it's the board of trustees that does the hiring. I should have been marketing myself to them not being known and loved by the performers. Uh, I mean, yes, that too, of course, but the board of trustees did the hiring. That was one piece of it. And the other piece was that when you're worried about money, and if you're on the board of a nonprofit, you are always worried about money. When you're worried about money, uh, there's an inclination to trust a man rather than a woman, whether hmm. they really have the, the qualifications or not. What I realized later was that I thought it was a problem with me. That's a, th that's a thing that women do. Women tend to say, oh, something went wrong. I must be the problem. And ultimately, later, I realized that, yes, I was the problem because I wasn't marketing myself well, but it wasn't a failing that I personally had. It just, I just wasn't doing the right kind of marketing. Hmm. One of the things about speaking in public or how you present yourself within an organization is that is marketing. It's, you are marketing yourself to the people who can help you, the people who can pay you, the people who can hire you, promote you, whatever it is, that's marketing. So fundamental, so, and speaking, and just to finish this, the thought, 
speaking is a tool. It's a really cool, fun tool, but it's actually a marketing tool, not really an end in itself. So, so when you do these speaking things, whether you're speaking within the company or to some kind of an outside conference, which I know you also help people do, um, the, the, the idea here is to help those uh, wh who may be much higher up in your company uh, to understand your value, not just to your peers, but also to them and their peers and, and building a reputation in the outside world to raise your value. Again, just like in marketing, people buy, that is to say higher, based on value or perceived value. Mm -hmm. And by raising the value that you have as a as a known expert, not only within the company, but also in the outside world, you raise the probability that you will be hired or, or promoted into that, into that role that you desire. Is that, is that a fair summary of what? That's what a fair just... summary. Uh, the other piece of it is when people see, when you're a known quantity, it's easy to take people for granted. That happens all the time. It's a normal human reaction. There's nothing like validation from outside. If somebody says, wow, Steve Kirsch just gave the most amazing speech at our conference and says that to your potential client, your potential client will go, oh, I didn't know Steve knew that. It's, it's one of the things I actually love when I'm working with one of my clients and they get they get comments from their friends and their coworkers saying, wow, I didn't know you knew all of that. So it's a way you can position yourself. It's all positioning. You know, you position yourself mm -hmm. as the as the person to be followed, the person who knows this, the strategic thinker. Hmm. Yeah. So, so um, you, you, you know, obviously strong background in, in music. And of course, that's one of the reasons that we connected was because of mm -hmm. our mutual musical backgrounds. Um, how does that translate from the nonprofit opera world into the, focused business executive world? Well, I spent 30 years teaching people how to be fabulous in front of a group, in front of an audience. <laughs> that's, basic, that was, that's your job as the director. And so when I started working with speakers, I did it uh, simultaneously for a while. And when I started working with speakers, I realized that the skills you need to sell a song are pretty much the same skills you need to sell a, a, a product or a service or within a company to sell an idea. It's still sales and it's the skills are pretty much the same. Uh, the big difference is vocabulary. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, you were teaching, you were encouraging people to do the right things. And as a performer, you know, it's, it's all about selling the song, selling the music, selling the mm -hmm. story, doing the same thing on stage, whether that's internal or external at a conference, it's still selling a story. It's still telling a story. It's still selling an idea. It's that, actually that more than that. Sense. It's more than that. It is using how you present yourself, your presentation skills to move people to take action. So not only are you just selling an idea, but you want them to actually do the thing you want them to do, whether it is donate to your nonprofit or um, authorize the spending for your department or convincing your team to to work with you, to, to be excited about what you need to do. Uh, I've had a couple of clients who are quality control experts. Everybody hates quality control experts. <laughs> I know I, I did that for 20 years. So <laughs> yeah, yes. Right. So how do you help a quality control expert get people, uh, get say software developers excited about going back and fixing the bugs in the software 
because the natural human thing is you've written the program. You feels like you're done, but you're not. It works. Yeah, right? it works. Kind of. But well, then, it's without errors. Let's put it that way. Right. That's well, when it's done from a software perspective. Right. Yeah. But getting it to go go back and then fix the bugs feels like you're you're addressing something that's that's over. It should be done. I shouldn't be have to, yeah. to do this again. So I have worked with several of my clients to or techniques to convince people that, yeah, only a piece of it's done. And here's why our pride, our reputation is involved in fixing the bugs so that just moving the moving the finish line, if you will, and then getting mm. people excited about it, which is really hard, actually. That's really interesting. You know, I, I spent 30 years myself in corporate and I never thought about the outcome as a, as a call to action, the outcome. I, I always knew what I wanted to have, you know, the result that I wanted out of the, whatever mm -hmm. presentation I was getting, right. Whether it was just updating information, but generally it was because I wanted my boss, my team, my peers, you know, my organization or the people that I was talking to, to do something. But I never thought about it in the same way that I think about a call to action in something that's marketing, right? That's pure, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sell people and in, you know, buying my coaching services or, 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 you know, my, my latest product, whatever that is. Right. So it's very interesting perspective on, um, using your speaking skills to encourage the audience, you know, beyond the the, the sales thing, but mm -hmm. to get them to take the action that you want them to. to. Uh, that, that's, I mean, you that's... can get them all excited about the value of, say, if you're a coach, to, about the value of coaching and how wonderful coaching is. But if they don't then actually click on the link and sign up for, you know, side of give you their credit card, it doesn't help. So uh, that's, that's another piece of it. One of the things that is really helpful is to use stories and metaphors. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, my client, Mei Lin, uh, is, uh, she is a quality control person. She works with a software group and they make medical devices. So the stakes are, you know, medical devices are mostly software these days. You've got, hmm. you might have the physical piece, but the thing that really makes them work nowadays is the software inside of it that makes it run. And what she, what we worked out is to get the people to enjoy getting it right. We talked about the Mars mission from, I think it was 1990, 1999, maybe, where you remember the Mars mission that blew up because one component was made in feet and inches and the other component was made in metrics? There, there have been several. The Hubble had yes. Hubble had a problem like that too, right? Yeah, there. well, there was a Mars mission that exploded and they discovered that Jet Propulsion Laboratories, and um, I think the other one was maybe Boeing, maybe not, but it was somebody else built another piece, and the two pieces couldn't talk to them because one company was working on a metric scale, the other company was working on feet and inches. So even though it's an old story, they all remembered that, all the people in her department, and so she started saying, no Mars mission." We are not going to have a Mars mission here because, of course, if it's a medical device and it malfunctions, people's lives are at stake. So they were talking about, uh, you know, so they put up signs, they have little pictures of Mars, they have little, it's, a, it's become a byline in the department, no Mars mission, we are going to check. Wow, that's great. Um, so I know you have a signature technique called strategic empathy. What, what, what is that about? How does that work? Well, as you're deciding how you're going to approach something, uh, the art of presenting yourself 
and uh, to become visible and valued, you have strategy, script, and style. Script is, are the words you use. Style is your delivery style, um, which is what I spent 30 years training people to do. Strategy is where it starts. And that's where strategic empathy means put yourself in the shoes of your listeners. Who are you speaking to? Who needs to hear what you have to say? And and what do they care about? Basically, it's mm. it's sell them what they want once they've hired you, you can give them what they need. But as for instance, you see all those car commercials where you see cars zipping along and so forth. They're not zipping along the coastal road and people, it's telling a story of someone driving a car in someplace beautiful. They're not talking about what's in the engine. They're not talking about the kind of steel that was used or fiberglass that was used to build the machine. They talk about what it feels like to drive it. So um, you and I are old enough to remember that Toyota used to have uh, a, a ad campaign called, Oh, What a Feeling, Toyota. Mm -hmm. That's what, um, that was some years ago, but you and I are old <laughs> enough to remember yeah. that one. I mean, maybe we some of your, your audience will remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's sort of, that's why they use glamorous models to sell things that don't have anything to do with physical beauty, but it makes you think, oh, I could be that person. I could be with that person. That person is going to want me if I just drink this beer or drive this car or whatever. Uh, it's the same thing when you are marketing your services, your product, your idea who are you, who's listening and what do they care about? Okay, cool. And, and what has you excited about your, the future for you and, and your business? I'm very excited about a program that I've been doing in bits and pieces that I'm now pulling into an online course and it's called visible and valued for executive women turning the things that I say all the time into an online course so that people can do it themselves. People can work together. I find when work, working with groups of women, having a community is very important. Mm -hmm. So having a cohort where people will keep you going uh, and expanding. I, I can see where my business can expand beyond just me, just time for dollars. That's great. And if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to get in touch? The easiest way is really LinkedIn. You can find me at Elizabeth Bachman. It's just, I'm the only one that's Elizabeth with a Z and B-A-C-H-M-A-N. Uh, you can also find me at, at ElizabethBachman.com. But LinkedIn is really where I'm mostly visible. Great. Elizabeth, do you have any final thoughts, things that you'd like to share with, with our audience? I have one thought. Whether you are, whether you, if you want to move people to take action, it is sales. And I know people tend to resist sales, but uh, it is a, it's an enrollment conversation. You call it sales. And sales is like sex. Nothing happens till somebody gets excited. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Profit Minds podcast. This is your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch. Please visit www.profitminds.net for other episodes or to contact me. Thank you for your positive feedback, comments, questions, and for sharing this show with others. Thanks for listening. Have a grateful day.